The recent studies of Neanderthal DNA have eliminated the Neanderthal as, as a plausible ancestor to modern humans. Okay, I mean, that, that logically also has to eliminate any possibility of humans being descended from anything more remote from us than the Neanderthal. And certainly that would include any kind of Homo erectus, such as Heidelbergensis, which is normally, you know, it, it, you know which is being touted as the common ancestor of, of humans and Neanderthals. You know, so in other words, the claim is that humans and Neanderthals are cousins, but that, that doesn't really work. Okay, Danny Vendermini has proposed a scheme in which Neanderthal predation drove more gracile hominids, the, the school Kafsa hominids from the Levant, into a fast process of evolution into Cro-Magnon man. Nonetheless, that doesn't work either. The, you know, the, the first Cro-Magnon people, the first humans that ever walked the earth, had all of their fancy artwork, all of their fancy tools, all of their fancy weapons in place pretty much from day one. The, something like the Atlatl, for instance, had been used elsewhere in our system as a fishing weapon, right? The, 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 the Cro-Magnon people didn't have to invent that when they came to Earth. And the artwork that you see in places like that uh, Cro-Magnon Sistine Chapel at Lasso, you know, Pablo Picasso even has, has called that as good as anything from the Renaissance or as good as anything being produced now. And there would have to be some kind of a run-up to that in these caves and in, in, in the places where you find the remains of, of these school cops and hominids, it just isn't anything like that. So there's no way to believe that that, that, that anybody went straight from, from, from hominids to Cro-Magnon man. I mean, it just doesn't work. So that the entire idea of humans being descended from hominids is unworkable. Now, there's another kind of a claim that you read, which, you know, to some people may seem to be a little bit more believable. Um, let me go over that. There's a claim that because some humans have a certain small number of genes in common with Neanderthals, that humans and Neanderthals must have interbred. This amounts to thinking that a Neanderthal male could or would rape a woman, and rather than cooking and eating her afterwards as usual, somehow or other, keep her alive long enough to bear a cross-species child, raise that child to reproductive age, and have that child breed back into human populations without anybody catching on. In other words, the claim is ridiculous. Um, I mean, it would be obvious that you've seen you know, previous videos have shown these reconstructions of Danny Vendermini's and of Jill Holland's. There's no way to believe that a human male would ever want to have anything to do with a Neanderthal female, right? I mean, the claim would have to be, you know, that you had offspring from a Neanderthal male and a human female. But in real life, Neanderthal females would kill that woman the first time her new owner ever left her alone for five minutes. Number one. Number two, the woman wouldn't fare any better than the subjects of the Soviet attempts to breed humans and apes into super workers in the 1930s. This was one of Joseph Stalin's brilliant ideas, right? It didn't work. There were no survivors. Um, humans would notice that the child was different. And I don't mean just a little bit different. It is seriously different. And humans would kill that child and everybody else like him as part of the same genocide war, the same program that killed out the Neanderthal, and they wouldn't need DNA tests to determine who to kill for that kind of reason. It would be exceedingly obvious. Again, you only have to look at these pictures. Uh, I mean, you know, even a half-breed child, if, if such a thing was even possible, you know, you know, I don't believe it was, but even if such a thing was possible, it would be hugely different from any normal human child. Okay. So in other words, it would be a miracle for something like that to ever happen once. But the um, claims that you get from the Max Planck Institute and uh, Svante Pavo would require that to be going on all the time. That is, for human hominid crossbreeding to have left detectable traces in the DNA of modern humans would have to have been entirely common. 
And so you have a conundrum, right? In other words, you're requiring, you know, something which is basically right next to impossible to be going on all the time. It's like you're requiring an infinite sequence of zero probability events. Now, one zero probability event in the history of the universe, maybe, right? but not an infinite series of them, not something that stands everything we know about probability on its head. One way or another, there would have to be a rational explanation for any common genes between humans and Neanderthals, but claims of past interbreeding between humans and Neanderthals is simply not rational. Okay, so there's a question as to whether I might have any kind of a better explanation for Neanderthal genes in modern humans, and there would be two parts to an answer to that. Uh, the first part says that me disproving a proposition does not place me under any sort of legal or moral obligation to provide the world with any sort of an alternative to the proposition. All it does is to remove the original proposition from the realm of respectability in the cases of claims of human descent from hominids and or past human interbreeding with hominids, I believe I've done that and thus have fulfilled the only obligation that I ever had in the picture. Okay, the second part says, do I have an actual hypothesis as to where the Neanderthal genes found in modern humans of European and Asian descent might have come from? And the answer is, that I don't have anything that I could absolutely demonstrate or prove, but I have what, what I consider to be a pretty good guess. Okay, and that assumes that the claims of such genes are believable, which may or may not be the case. Um, I say you are what you eat, right? And we, what we have might be an extreme case of that. Henry G. published an article about bacterial, bacterial insertion of genes in The Guardian, and... He noted that, um, that, that hundreds of genes containing instructions for at least 223 proteins seem to have been imported directly from bacteria into the human genome. Some responsible for features of human metabolism, otherwise hard to explain, such as our ability to metabolize psychotropic drugs. This monoamine oxidase is involved in metabolizing alcohol. And he goes on to say that if the importation of bacterial genes for novel purposes such as drug resistance sounds disturbing and familiar, it should. This is precisely the thrust of much research into the genetic modification of organisms, which goes on in agriculture and biotechnology today. In other words, it almost looks as if somebody in past ages was doing some of the same kind of work which is going on today in biotech firms and was experimenting with the human genome, okay? So that you've got this question of bacterial insertion of genes. One way to get bacteria into your system is to eat something containing the bacteria, right? That's pretty simple. Here's what I believe you have to picture, right? You have to picture some Cro-Magnon war party traipsing around the Alps until somewhere around 4 p.m. they fight a pitched battle with the Neanderthal family group. Those guys are cut, bleeding, dead, tired. Might be 10 or 12 Neanderthals lying around dead, and one of the cro Manions says something like, uh, you know, man, this has been a hell of a day. I'm so hungry I could eat just about anything. And I'm way too tired to go off hunting right now. What the hell is there to eat around this place? And I don't think you should need to be Albert Einstein to figure out what those guys are eating that evening. And unless those early humans were to cook a Neanderthal very thoroughly, which is highly unlikely under those kinds of circumstances, then you'd still be talking about bacterial insertion and the possibility of bacterial, bacterial content, rather, and the possibility of bacterial insertion of genes. And th this is where the whole thing becomes funny. It's like you've got not only anthropologists and paleontologists interested in this sort of this sort of a thing, but like gang members, right, are, are, are looking at these pictures of Danny Vendramini's and thinking to themselves, gee, that's cool. You know, I wish I could look like that, you know, fierce and mean like that. It's like everybody, and nobody would bother me, right? 
and you've got a company which panders for that, right? Which you've got at least one company which, for a reasonable fee, will allow people to send in DNA swabs and then come back with a computer readout, you know, like you are 2.734% Neanderthal, right? So, so here you've got a member of the, you know, MS-13 or the Crips of the Bloods or the, one of the Tong societies or whatever. So, gee, I, you know, like I'm bad, right? I'm 2.736% Neanderthal. I mean, nobody better mess with me. And, you know, that's what's going on. I call that the Neander scam. And... You know, that's that's just one aspect of this study of human origins. Until next time.